breaking news on the Drexel University student who died recently of meningitis. It is confirmed the 19-year-old sophomore who died in March was linked to the Princeton outbreak that left eight people sick, and federal health officials just confirmed it was the same infection. Last year, we heard a lot about bacterial meningitis on college campuses. Dr. Frieda Lewis Hall, Chief Medical Officer of Pfizer, is here with some advice for those headed back to school. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. Always great to be here. And looking to see what precautions people should take when they go off to school is Kyra Anderson, daughter of actor and comedian Anthony Anderson. She's headed to college this fall. She's here with her mom, Alvina. Welcome to you both. Thank you. So glad to have you here. And as you've just heard, Kyra, uh, bacterial meningitis can be deadly. It's when the bacteria attacks the protective membrane that surrounds the brain and the spinal cord, and that leads to inflammation and swelling. Well, my first question is, how do you know you have bacterial meningitis? Well, Kyra, unfortunately, sometimes it's not always clear. Things to look out for if you're watching at home, severe headache, a stiff neck, fever, even confusion, changes in level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Now, infants, if you're a parent, your infant may appear sluggish or have poor feeding. Now, if there's a known outbreak, you might want to look out for sensitivity to light or maybe a rash that develops that's kind of purplish red in nature. And then as the disease progresses a little bit later, it can actually have symptoms of seizure and coma. Why does it strike college students? Meningitis can occur at any age, no matter where you're at. It's more easily spread in college, where people are in dorms, other places in the military, again, people in barracks, boarding schools, even camps. And that's because infectious diseases spread more quickly when you're in larger groups, gathered together in those close mm -hmm. quarters, like dorm rooms, as an example. How do you get infected with it? Why don't we show everyone? We're gonna play a game of Spin the Bottle, Frida, because it is important to know what to look out for. And here's the biggest thing. You can get it from respiratory or oral and throat secretions. So you have to be aware you can get it through sharing food. Another way is, believe it or not, sharing a simple bottle of water because again, those oral secretions mm -hmm. could potentially pass the bacteria from one person to another. And Kyra, should you go off to school and meet the person of your dreams, this is a no. <laughs> if the person has any of the symptoms we just talked about or seems ill in any way. Here's another no. She is about to cough or sneeze right into her hands. That's one of the easiest ways to spread infection. One of the best ways to prevent spreading infection is if you're sneezing or coughing, do so into a tissue. If you're going to sneeze or cough and don't have a tissue, do so into your elbow or into your upper arm. Also, you want to make sure that you wash your hands as often as possible and that you do it with soap and with warm water. So, Kyrie, the whole point here is not to frighten you. Most of the bacteria that cause meningitis, it's not as contagious as the viruses that cause the common cold or even the flu. You're not at risk simply by breathing the air around those who might be infected or in terms of maybe if they do have meningitis. That's true. But people who are infected, if they cough or sneeze and those droplets go out into the air, someone nearby can breathe those droplets in and become infected. Or if somebody touches the droplets that are left somewhere and then touches their own nose or mouth, they can be infected that way. So the real key here is to know your environment and to know the behaviors that spread bacterial meningitis. Meningitis can progress really rapidly. So if you think you have it, you have to see a doctor as soon as possible. It can be treated with antibiotics, but despite antibiotic treatment, 10 to 15% of patients still die. 11 to 19% of those who survive may be afflicted with brain damage, hearing loss, learning disabilities, or loss of limbs, and that's why raising awareness is important. And then this is a great transition time for you to touch base with your doctor or with the College Health Center to find out whether or not there are any vaccinations or boosters that would be right for you. Now, this is also a situation where vaccines may not completely protect you. So this is important time for parents. Talk to your young people about these risks. Now, we've told you a lot. But if you want more information, you can always go to GetHealthyStayHealthy.com. Thank you. And you can also visit, as always, thedoctorstv.com. Dr. Lewis Hall, thank you as always. Thank we'll you be right so back. much. Thank you.